వెల్కమ్ టు ఈ పీజీ పాఠశాల మై నేమ్ ఈస్ దుగిరాల వసంత ఐమ్ ఆన్ ద టీచింగ్ ఫ్యాకల్టీ ఆఫ్ డిపార్ట్మెంట్ ఆఫ్ లింగ్విస్టిక్స్ ఉస్మానియా యూనివర్సిటీ హైదరాబాద్ మై లెక్చర్ టుడే ఈజ్ బిలాంగ్స్ టు కోర్స్ టెన్ సైకోనియో లింగ్విస్టిక్స్ ద టాపిక్ ఈజ్ స్పీచ్ ప్రొడక్షన్ విత్ ఎ ఫోకస్ ఆన్ హౌ సౌండ్స్ బిహేవ్ విత్ ఇన్ వర్డ్స్ ఇన్ టుడేస్ లెక్చర్ ఐ విల్ కాన్సన్ట్రేట్ ఆన్ త్రీ పాయింట్స్ వన్ ఈస్ how different phonological representations are acquired by children how sounds are learned and used as part of early words and uh, then i'll offer some examples from one or two indian languages you know from basic linguistics course that uh, you we make a distinction between phones phonemes features syllables and words this is what i mean by representations and i really do i don't think i need to give you examples but on the screen you will see phone is uh, you know enclosed in square brackets because it's uh, n- not established whether it is meaningful or not in a given language phoneme on the other hand is uh, enclosed in uh, slashes because um, you know i mean we do that after doing phonological analysis and establishing phonemes of a given language then uh, a whole lot of features make up the phonemes so in this case k is a velar and uh, the uh, velarity the velar consonant combines with the vowel to become a syllable so ka ki kai these are all syllables then you have words so syllables come together to form words like cat kit kite mm-hmm. so these are phonological representations now Uh, you know in the 50s jacobson uh, roman jacobson proposed a hierarchy of ch- uh, how these representations are learned by children according to he also thought it is universal that children world over always make a distinction learn to make a distinction between oral sounds versus nasal sounds that's the first contrast that children all over the world acquire once they're able to distinguish how air is coming out through the mouth cavity there are all the oral sounds and in in the case of ma and na and ya uh, the uh, their nasal sounds the much of the air is coming through the nasal cavity once the distinction is acquired they go to the next contrast which according to him is obstruent versus sonorant what is the main difference between obstruent and sonorant in obstruents which are basically stops fricatives and affricates we are stopping the air stream for few milliseconds uh, you know whereas in most sonorants uh, we don't stop the uh, air stream and also uh, in the speech perception module you would have learned obstruents are not acoustically as uh, in terms of loudness they're not as loud as sonorants sonorants are very loud what are sonorants nasals vowels semi vowels uh, laterals trills so obstruent versus sonorant distinction is acquired by children after that they make a distinction between coronal labial dorsal place of articulation whether the tongue we lift the tongue and make a coronal articulation by touching the palate the 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 or whether we are making labials ma v f b or dorsal articulations back sounds that place of articulation distinctions emerge next they make a distinction between voiced and voiceless and uh, fifth they make a distinction between stops and fricatives and lastly um, world over they he thought children uh, continue to make mistakes uh, between la and ra ra is the sound which is the most difficult according to the phone, you know inventories that they most textbooks tell us that children don't learn ra till they are four or five or even six years or even the distinction between the fricatives th and the so this is the hierarchy that jacobson proposed now why why did he give this uh, hierarchy his point was that there are two principles one is markedness principle that sonorants are more marked than obstruents um, that is uh, and hence learnt later uh, in phonology class in linguistics you would have learnt about marked and unmarked unmarked sounds are the ones which are more frequent in languages of the world they are learnt earlier they are easy to produ- produce whereas whatever is marked are learnt later so markedness according to markedness principle children learn sounds uh, 
relatively rare sounds like you know all the firs and thirs they're not many words with that they're not very common so marked sounds are learned later so one explanation is markedness second explanation is implicational universals that is um they studied um, hundreds of languages and they found that if any language has fricative sounds it will also have stops in other words uh, fricative is more complex stop fricative contains both stop process as well as uh, release process i mean the uh, air is es- escapes um slowly uh, through the you know making a, a little bit of noise so if a child can produce fricative the child can also produce stops so implication implicational universal thirdly stops are expected to be learned earlier than fricatives which are in turn learned earlier than affricates again there is a kind of articulatory complexity or ease or whatever it is visibility children can see the um, stop sounds are much more easier than the affricates and things like that so these are some of the explanations given to the so called universal hierarchy of the way children learn sounds uh but then again more and more cross linguistic research and phonology how children acquire sounds uh, question this hierarchy in spanish for instance continuant non continuant distinction that is fricatives versus stop distinction is acquired much earlier than by english children all right um and compared to even voiced and voiceless a distinction in uh, kishe mayan language of mexico children acquire children i believe acquire affricate consonant ch uh, much earlier than sh uh, which is acquired earlier than sh acquired than earlier than pa ta and ka which sounds little uh, odd because even in our languages pa and ta are acquired earlier so there is something cross linguistic research is going against jacobson's uh, universal hierarchy further uh, phonologists are also not able to talk about universals in acquiring sounds because there is a regression in child language children who are able to produce a sound or a sound contrast correctly suddenly they start making mistakes when they are older they they make mistakes when they are younger they don't make mistakes how do you explain this right this is a regression and also perception and memory factors um, were not considered uh, su- uh, sufficiently by phonologists in the past now more and more uh, researchers are paying attention to the role of perception in acquiring sounds and role of memory cross linguistic variation in the so called universal phonological features um, uh, are explained uh, and, you know um so what are the cross linguistic uh, features that did not agree with the um, jacobson's hierarchy one is that languages differ uh, tremendously in relation to dental and alveolar place of articulation dentals are much forward alveolar is at the alveolar position which is slightly behind there is a whole range of sounds Uh, in some languages you have three way distinction some languages four way distinction in place of articulation and vowel harmony is another feature um, which works differently in different languages consonant gemination uh, is present in finnish in telugu in many of our languages we have pitchi katchi kottu uh, long consonants english doesn't have that uh, phonotactic rules uh like i explained in the switch perception modules telugu allows sa followed by ra english does not allow so which consonant can follow which other consonant is language specific this kind of uh, cross linguistic variation across languages um, makes uh, variation in the way children acquire speech sounds and make words out of them um so gemination especially is a very very lot of research is coming up in recent years gemination uh, falls at the junction between phonetics and phonology and demand a new conceptualization about the relationship remember in the past 50 60 70s uh, decades of 50 60 70s researchers thought um, phonetics 
is uh, universal, phonology is language specific, they are two different things. And of course, you somehow make connection between the sound properties and mentally stored words, lexicon. So, you have phonetics, uh, sound properties, phonology, the way sounds combine with each other uh, in language specific way and then you have lexicon, three different things. As opposed to that, uh, that is the modular conceptualization, that they are all different modules, alright. In other words, Jacobson's hierarchy assumes a modular view about phonological acquisition, that phonetics and phonology are separate from lexicon, alright. To account for cross-linguistic differences, in recent years, researchers began to say, we have to question that modular conception, it does not work, alright. So, you see the picture on the screen now, you see that you have phonetics, phonology and lexicon are overlapping, all three of them are overlapping. So, this is a new way of looking at lexicon, phonetics, phonology interface and unless you take this perspective, you cannot explain why there is so much variation in the way children are acquiring sounds and learning to make use those sounds to make up words. So, this new uh, idea of in interface or interaction among phonetics, phonology and lexicon has informed a new theory called radical templatic phonology uh, in the uh, 90s. And in this view, uh, theorization about phonological acquisition, that is phonemes, features, syllables, they exist. Uh, these constructs which have always been there as part of linguistics exist, but they are defined in terms of their role in word structure. That is, this new theory is saying the way phonemes and features and syllables um, behave um, in within words in different languages is different. Every language have a particular word template, phonemes and features behave differently within those word templates. In this new theory called radical templatic phonology, basic phonological word is word, um, basic phonological unit is word. Um, in the past, the basic one is phoneme, here it, we have moved to word and we should examine variation in relation to speakers, dialects, utterances, context. How is it that children who understand uh, words uttered by different speakers, different dialects, different type way of speaking in different contexts, they still go to the same meaning of that word. How is that possible? Your attention should be more to that rather than you know, phonemes and features and you know whether they made this contrast or you know some other contrast which we discussed earlier. So, um, basically in this new way of looking at uh, phonological acquisition, um, the focus should be on language use and not on uh, language knowledge. Um, I am sure uh, you uh, we are familiar with the notion of phonological process, processes that all small children below the age of 3 exhibit. When children are growing up, they are learning a language, they um, display simplifying processes. Adult words are simplified, alright. Um, most children cannot, the child who cannot say sir will substitute sir with the. So, a Telugu word like sanchi which means bag becomes tanchi, right. So, lo, almost all children go through the stage where they exhibit phonological processes. Let us look at some important processes. Stopping, what is stopping? J what I gave you just now, substituting the for sir. If it is an English child, Instead of saying C, the child says T because Sir is not acquired yet. So, what is happening uh, uh, when uh, Sir is produced as T? Uh, the child is stopping the air stream when he or she should not be stopping. You should say S, S, you know, the air should escape gradually, it should not be stopped. So, this process is called stopping. That is C becoming T is an example of phonological process called stopping in which the air stream is stopped when it should not be stopped. Another process is called assimilation. An English speaking child instead of saying duck, the child says guck. What exactly is happening? Here 
the later occurring velar sound ka is influencing the first sound okay instead of saying the which requires moving the place of articulation the child is staying with velar articulation so ka is velar g is velar so uh, duck is becoming guck because both ga and ka are of the same place so it's much simpler to stay at the same place than move the tongue quickly so duck becoming guck is called assimilation and it's kind of regressive like from back to they can also exhibit forward assimilation you can learn from the textbooks the third major process children exhibit is fronting so instead of saying goat the child will say doth so ga is a back sound the is a front sound therefore the process is called fronting the child is fronting so uh, this uh, then metathesis uh, uh, extremely common even our uh, children learning our languages exhibit metathesis metathesis is displacing the order of phonemes within words so uh, instead of saying animal the child says aminal all right um i can think of uh, a child that i know uh, in telugu instead of saying uh, kavali uh, the child would say kalavi or something like that you know uh, so it's extremely common even in our languages if you pay attention uh, they, i'm talking about 2 years 2 and a half years small children cluster reduction is another process dress becoming uh, des or, or not desk but des uh involving pronouncing one segment uh, of a word initial uh, or word final cluster that is dr they could not say dr so they remove r out of it so it becomes des or if you take desk then they'll say des by removing k in the final position so the clusters which again this remember uh, there are certain languages you cannot have a word with a cluster in the initial position or there are languages in which you can't end words with clusters here much of the examples i'm giving you are from english where clusters are possible in certain languages they're not possible what is the implication of this it means that in those languages where clusters are not allowed children will not there is no question of cluster reduction so phonological processes are language specific final consonant deletion so there are a lot of english speaking children don't say the final consonant bike becomes by um uh, it may sound awkward but it's extremely commonly reported phonological process among english speaking children and in all my research uh, my colleagues research in the department on phonological processes in telugu we never come across uh final consonant deletion telugu children don't delete final consonant so the point that i'm trying to make is we learn about simplifying processes but they're all language specific languages uh, phonotactic regularities or uh, uh, which phonemes are more frequent which are not more frequent this kind of language specific features influence the way children learn sounds and use those sounds within words so the conclusion is phonological processes are language specific they notice till now we have given most of the examples are given focusing on consonant but phonological processes can also uh, involve vowels they can also involve prosodic features like stress they are governed by language specific considerations uh, not only in terms of phoneme inventories syllable structures word templates that is uh, what just now i explained to you what kind of consonant is allowed in a language chinese japanese you can't have clusters they don't allow um, let us look at some phonological processes in hindi speaking children so um chawal uh, the child uh, chawal which you all know uh, is rice the child says chabal all right from roti the child is saying roti uh so fronting ta is at the back ta is in front so it's fronting in chabal chabal uh, basically stopping uh, uh assimilation sabun the child is saying mamun so the ma the na nasal sound sabun na is influencing the non nasal sa 
and the whole thing is becoming nasal mamun ghas is becoming gash the aspiration is gone sa is become sh uh, so it is backing remember from your uh, speech perception uh, module uh, the sh is more front sa is more back palatally so uh, the child is preferring to say gash as, as opposed to ghas metathesis chipkeli is pronounced by the child as chikepli um so there's a reversal of the order of the constituents i mean order of the phonemes within words gliding tala lock the child is saying taya la is uh, retroflex uh, lateral is replaced by uh, you know uh, the semi vowel ya taya which is simpler so it's called gliding ya is glide therefore phonological process is called gliding uh sabji vegetable the child is saying chebji uh so again here this application problem is there so but if you stare at this child's pronunciations the overall shape of the word is there only something is happening to the sounds within words that's why in my title of this lecture i said sounds in words so what what happens to the way children utter sounds within words uh, you look at it the template is maintained so if you take the chawal becoming chabal why is this called stopping because the child instead of producing the uh, fricative were is stopping it's quite obvious right same thing with sabun mabun i have already explained to you assimilation is taking place right because na is uh, influencing the production of a non nasal sa and everything is becoming nasal it's a regressive assimilation right so um basically about phonological processes the point that i am trying to stress in this lecture is we have to pay attention to perception which early phonologists ignored we cannot take a child form and go on analyzing it as though perception has no influence on production whereas i am saying we have to look at perception based phonological uh, theories which are more recent according to these relatively new theories the uh, pattern of emergence of features or phonemes is modified by the input from the environment what is it that the child is exposed to what what kind of sounds and what kind of words and how much is being spoken to the child therefore we must examine phonetic phonological and lexical factors together remember the diagram i showed you earlier there is a phonetic thing there is a phonolo phonology module and there is lexicon module but all of them are interacting so when we are trying to analyze the mistakes children make don't just take out what is coming out of the child's mouth and go on analyzing it and give it a name stopping uh, fronting that's not enough that's just a production based analysis what i am trying to stress here is you also have to connect it up to perception and input and what kind of early words this child is exposed to lexicon so <clears throat> recent research has shown that many sounds and sound sequences present even during babbling appear in early words uh, remember babbling happens at the age of 6 months children say pa 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 da 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 you know like they, they just babble but researchers saying that babbling stage is continuous there is a continuum between babbling and first words there is some uh, correlation between babbling and first words uh, first, when do the first words occur according to uh, western textbooks they say first words appear at 18 months but many uh, data from indian languages our children start speaking their first meaningful words as early as 12 or 12 months or 14 months so there is a uh, continuation between babbling and first words is what they are saying in other words stored representations get integrated in perception and production uh, so when they are babbling some of those syllab syllables those representations are there in the child's mind and then the child keeps hearing input so a child who perhaps uh, uttered some Uh, sounds which are not part of his language when he is 6 months old will drop out those those uh, sounds and will stick to sounds which are part of his native language what he is hearing at home if there is only one language all right so stored representations 
the child combines the stored representations with the perception and um, production. Uh, in other words, the child's cognitive development, the development is speaking not only in terms of the way the child moves the lips or the tongue or the jaw or the articulators, the child's cognitive develop, uh, cognition is developing. Memory is improving, attention is, is able to focus more as the child grows. So the cognitive processes like attention, memory and even sensory motor knowledge. The, the moment the child becomes a toddler, two years, starts walking out of the house, the language comes out. So the sensory motor knowledge, the memory, the attention, all these processes impinge on the way sounds are acquired and used meaningfully within words by children. So in other words, there is an interaction between phonology and lexicon. Babbling supports phonological development by interfacing attention, perception and sensory motor processes underlying early words. Phonological development is non-linear. We cannot like Jacobson uh, talked about that uh, it is linear. Easy sounds are first and more difficult sounds come later, there are stages. That linearity is now questioned, it is non-linear. That is why we are able to explain about, um, you know, a child who said a sound correctly when he is younger, a little later he makes a mistake. That regression can be explained within this new way of looking at phonology. We need to measure the complexity of word structures in child language, uh, the newly proposed measure one or two measures, I will give you examples, I'll work it out for you with one or two words. But what would be very nice is take these measures, apply it to data from Hindi or any other languages, Indian languages that you know and uh, start collecting data and analyzing data use, using these measures. One measure is called phonological mean length of utterance, for short PMLU, phonological mean length of utterance. What is PMLU? PMLU is a count of number of sounds in a word plus number of consonants. Do you see what I am saying? So let us take the original, uh, you know, what I have, I, I read to prepare this lecture, I got the example from Finnish, but it does not matter. Let us look at a Finnish example called Vene. I believe in Finnish, Vene means boat. Now, this is a correct adult target, Vene. In Vene, you see how many sounds are there? Four, right? V, E, N, E. So, take four. There are four different sounds. Then add consonants. How many consonants are there in Vene? V and N, two. So, Vene has a PMLU of six, right? Now, suppose the word is, you know, the Finnish word is tractory. Tractor, it is a much difficult word. So, let us see how many sounds are there? T, R, A, C, T, O, R, 8. So, take 8. How many consonants are there? T, R, K, T, R, different consonants, okay, 5. So, 8 plus 5 is 13. So, tra uh, tractory has a PMLU of 13. Number of different sounds, number of consonants. You add those two, you get PMLU. Suppose you have a small child, 2 year old child learning Finnish. Instead of saying vene, the child says nene, right? Now, by using PMLU, we can say when the child says nene, let us count, uh, let us do the PMLA count. You have 1, 2, 3, 4, 4 different sounds. Only n is there. So, add 1 for consonant. So, you get 5. Since only one consonant in the target is pronounced correctly. Let us look at one more measure. Proportion of whole word proximity, PWP, okay. This is calculated by dividing PMLU, which I have already explained to you, by that is child's PMLU by adult PMLU. We have been talking about, I gave you the example of Finnish words, uh, the child mispronounced uh, Vene as Nene. So, you have two, two uh, numbers. One is the adult target and one is a child's PMLU. Divide one by the other, you get PWP. So, uh, for the second word that lactoli, the child said for a tractory, the PWP would be 9 by 13, which will be 0.69. You go back and check it out by yourself later on. 
then the third one is called proportion of whole word correctness pwc this is calculated by dividing total number of words the child produces correctly by the number of words in the sample so you you collect for few minutes total number of words you have out of that what the child pro pro produced correctly you divide both you get um, proportion of whole word correctness so pmlu pwp uh, pwc are some of the new measures that child phonologists are using these days to find out about phonological development so until now we we are going on saying word you know but what is a word word in english you get any number of uh, simple monosyllabic words mostly they are all monosyllables but outside of english you may not get cat mat bat kind of words right we have already talked about this in telugu everything is cv cv so you have kalu balu malu chettu uh, you know they they are not uh, you know they always have two syllables so they, but there is no need to equate word with monosyllable outside of english di syllables dominate early vocabularies of lots of languages estonian finnish french hebrew hindi japanese spanish swedish welsh all these languages have lot more bisyllables than monosyllables and therefore much of the theorizing is about monosyllables but we need to now do more work on languages which are very different from english to understand how sounds um, evolve how children make use of the sounds uh, within words so commonly occurring words have the structure i've already mentioned this to you cv cv in telugu um, so to come to the end of my lecture today about sounds in words uh, how children learn sounds um two main points language learners are sensitive to very early on children become sensitive to phonotactic regularities uh, uh, you know which govern the kind of words which are allowed in a given language the certain sounds can occur in the initial position of a word certain sounds are banned in the final position or you know those are phonotactics so according to a new um, uh, relatively new theory i introduce you radical templatic phonology um, which is uh, described by croft and weeman i have given the reference in the e text please read the original uh, article children develop implicit phonological grammar out of the words they learn as wholes as words all right since word is identified by the child as the same by its meaning uh, in the context of its use that is the child very early remembers the word as a whole so whenever it is used by grandmother by mother or it is outside or in the school the child is able to remember that word and therefore the focus should be the unit of analysis should be word and not feature or a phoneme or a syllable um this particular point is explained very well in using hindi data in the e text so i urge you to look at the hindi data in the e text uh, to try and understand uh, this new theory i hope you understood the main points uh, of my lecture uh, but do consult the e text if you have any doubts thank you